Hello, welcome to the Cube Conversation. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube here in Palo Alto, California. We're here with some SiliconANGLE and Cube news. We have some funding announcement. Christine Yen, the CEO of Honeycomb.io. Cube alumni, great to see you again. Big news. Thanks for coming on here for this Cube Conversation and SiliconANGLE news. It's great to be back. Thanks for having me, John. So we just posted a story this morning. You guys had released a $50 million Series D funding. Congratulations. It's a real big milestone in this market where there's a large percentage of people having a hard time raising money, yet early stage seed with the AI surge is booming. Cloud native is booming. This is a tale of two cultural shifts of entrepreneurship and growth and it's a, it's a leveling out. It's almost like, I won't call it a purge because that's like a little bit too over the top, but mm -hmm. you're seeing a transition. This is where we're starting to see markers. So I really want to get into it. So before we get into that conversation, we've got KubeCon coming up in Amsterdam. Let's talk about the funding. Give us the news. How much did you raise? Give us the numbers. Who's in? Any new investors, same investors? And what are you going to use the money for? Yeah, um, we're raising the Series D, 50 million. Um, really excited to have, frankly, all existing investors back. Um, this round was led by Headline, uh, participated in by Scale Venture Partners, Insight uh, Partners, as well as uh, longtime supporters, Storm Ventures and um, uh, Industry. We are so excited um, to be able to raise this round and announce this round. Um, it's not not a, uh, or this, this was a preemptive round really driven by the level of interest and observability really uh, hitting, you know, hitting new heights last year uh, between Gartner's Magic Quadrant, um, naming us as a leader and our O'Reilly book uh, being released, Observability Engineering. It really feels like observability has finally moved from this buzzword that folks are curious about to a real established movement and, um, that people are hungry for, you know, help understanding. Open telemetry, of course, is a huge part of that. Um, last year, I think it was it became news that it, open telemetry was officially the second most active project as part of the CNCF. Um, you know, we we've seen that at KubeCons, and so we're really excited about the one coming up in Amsterdam. Um, and the momentum around that project, again, is just really a testament to the level of interest and excitement around observability as a new way of understanding the more complex systems we keep building today. And we'll have them on, certainly at the Cube, we'll be in Amsterdam as well. We've been to every KubeCon there is. There have been, uh, I didn't go last year, I had a little, little bit of a COVID problem, but that's gone. But I want to get into what you said. We talked before you came on camera about cloud native growth and this obviously series D is validation obviously, but you have more future plans with the company. I'm sure there's probably growth in product, go to market sales growth, but the, the macro, I get that. But, but before we get into the specifics, there seems to be an underlying growth around how cloud and we're calling it super cloud in our conversations has created this mm -hmm. whole effect where you can build a cloud company on top of the CapEx that Amazon, Azure have built, right? So you have all the CapEx players who have built billions of dollars in, 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 in infrastructure. And you sit on top of that, that seems to be this cloud native sweet spot right now where you can have the benefits of cloud, but now build scalable platforms where you need the new cloud native observability. You need containers as a service, you need Kubernetes. This seems to be a trend. What's your take on this? Because you're in the middle of it. It seems like a new operating system is going to sit on top of the cloud for companies that don't even need to spend any CapEx. You know, I think the truth of the world that we're in is that there, every, you know, every cycle, there's this paradigm shift in how we build software. Uh, sometimes it is because there's a new, new technology that drags along a bunch of uh, changes in how we need to deploy or how we need to structure our logic. Sometimes it's driven by social uh, practices. Pract uh, new practices like platform engineering or SRE are changing how the humans building the software want to interact with the other humans, and along with that, drives a change in technology. Um, and I, you know, this is this is the beauty of tech, right? The world is just changing so quickly. The the tools that we're using in, in building that future future change quickly. And you know, as far as observability is concerned, the tools that we then need to make sense of these new systems that we've built we need to uh, need to similarly keep up. And the CNCF has really been focused on this and, and observability is on the rise. And is that because of developer uptake or just the need for metrics, instrumentation? Where's the growth coming from? Is it gaps, is it just evolution? What's the 
what's the, where's the tailwind? What's the big tailwind for you guys in observability? I think that uh, a lot of this current excitement um, around open telemetry, I think it was rooted in the rise of tracing. Uh, distributed tracing is a way of capturing telemetry from your software systems that is able to show relationships and connections in a way that is m so much more important in these days where we have these complex distributed systems, whether it's across containers or microservices or clouds or serverless functions. Um, all of these things play into needing an, a, a more expressive data format uh, to reflect w what your logic is doing. And where open, where open telemetry and honeycomb really shine is saying, hey, let's let's take the the old data patterns that worked in our old simpler world and maybe you know set them aside and consider consider this new pair consider this new world, this new way of describing what the heck our code is doing and why it's not doing what we expect. Yeah. That's the core problem, and that's that's why um, you know. The, the, this problem that Honeycomb solves is never going to go away. The code that we think that we're writing is never exactly yeah. the code that is yeah. executing out there in front of our customers. Yeah. And engineering teams are always going to need to figure out, uh, be able to close that loop. And, and you got to you got to roll you got to roll your eyes too when you see all the AI code being generated. It's only going to create more noise. I mean, oh, come yeah. on, like I, like I saw, oh, it just writes my code. No, no, it's not the way it has to work. This is a huge mm -hmm. issue around software supply chain. These are huge issues. So productivity aside, I mean, I could be more productive putting crappy code in the system with AI. But this is a new dynamic. What's your take on this? Just that, anecdotally, as this new wave hits with AI, not to go on a tangent, but this you mentioned yeah. new code no, coming I, in. Very relevant. Um, Honestly, AI ops as a as a as a, you know, a phrase has been part of this world for years, and I think that like some of this AI generated code and some of the hype around it, the trap is always in believing that robots can do the work for you. AI is a tool; it is something that can augment your humans, can make them more powerful, and um, you know we are certainly. I won't I won't give away anything that uh, we're not ready to share yet, but I'll say that our interest is absolutely in how we can leverage some of these new technologies to build mega suits around your humans, not robots. We're not trying to yeah. promise that we can do your work better than your engineers, but we bet we can make your engineers more productive, more uh, you know insightful, more uh, able to use these superpowers to get back to what the humans are really good at, which is being creative and solving problems. Yeah, I mean, AI should make good coders great and great coders exceptional. You know, this is where, this is a human loop. They talk about the human loop, this is huge. You know, this is back in the old, is there AI for AI? I'm looking forward to talking more and I, and it sounds like you got some stuff going on there, which we'll try to get out of you in another interview, but uh, <laughs> some other time. stay on the news sure. here. Cause I, I love some of the stories you guys are talking about in the, in, the, in, the, in the press and our story. You guys have this approach around three pillars, logs, metrics, and tracing. And you talk about socio-technical systems. Could you define that? What is socio-technical systems mean? Happy to. Um, it is the acknowledgement that despite, you know, the, the, the focus on the technology that we're all using, ultimately the, the systems that we're building are a blend of the technologies that we use and the process, culture, and humans necessary to build them. Uh, when we look at software engineering practices, so many of them, uh, and, and some, some misguided folks will say, oh, we just need to buy this new technology and, and all of our problems will be solved. And the truth is you can buy the technology, but you won't realize the value until you really start to think about how will my humans use this? How do I do the change management? How do I um, make sure that my practices are aligned with the technology investments I'm, I'm making, whether you know, how you're architecting your software or the, the tools you're using to make sense of them. Um, we think the two are, the two sides are irrevocably uh, tied together. And that's why so much of our focus is, like I said, around making our customers, human teams be great through technology, never replacing or, uh, yeah. or you know, making promises we don't think we can do. Yeah, I think, I think people go to the knee jerk reaction, of, oh my God, AI is going to, you know, Skynet and, you know, they go dark. There's a lot of work that's been done over the years. I mean, AI has been, been a great discipline. I remember in the 80s when I was getting my degree, AI principles were all, there was no compute. You had to build models, mm -hmm. it was so hard to get into the game. I think what I like about cloud native and the cloud is you can get into the game quick, build value and grow it. And I think 
And when automation starts the conversation, you got to think about things like automatic instrumentation and observability, um, monitoring, all these things. This is a core part of your thesis for your company. Automating, instrumentation, and observability for all. What is the next phase of growth for you guys with this investment? What are you guys going to focus on? What's next? Obviously, open source is growing beautifully. We're seeing that continue to be the bedrock. I'm a big believer that that'll be a big part of the AI piece. We'll get that later. But for you guys, what's the future look like with the investment? Yeah, I think the things that we haven't already talked about uh, include geo expansion. Uh, right now, we are heavily, you know, many of our customers are in the US. We have some folks in EMEA, some folks in APAC, but we really want to uh, have build a better solution to support the global software teams that we know are out there. Um, I think that we're also really interested in is thinking about the entire development ecosystem. Um, you know, ultimately, what, do, what, what, is, what does observability promise and Honeycomb really sell? We sell the truth about what your code is doing when you're not watching it. Well, who needs that? Well, it's going to be every other software tool out there that promises to make a change about what's going on in production. Um, we have, uh, we, today we have something like 100 integrations already um, with partners like AWS and LaunchDarkly and CircleCI. Um, but I think that there's a lot more there that we haven't, we've only begun to scratch the surface of. So Christine, I'm, I'm very see, impressed uh, with your, in that. I'm impressed with the success. Remember our conversation in 2018, we were like speaking a whole other language, but it was still the same game, observability cloud native. Last time we spoke on theCUBE, give an update on Honeycomb. What's the culture like for the company? Obviously success validated with this $50 million series D in this market, huge congratulations on that. What are you guys doing for culture? What's it like to work there? Put a plug in for the company for people watching. I, my co-founder and I started Honeycomb after having been in Silicon Valley for years and having seen um, a lot of startups build really great products, but lose their way. Um, and so we, when we started the company, one of the things we committed to absolutely was being as thoughtful about building the, the company and the, the humans as much as the technology and the business. Um, a couple of ways this manifested, uh, you know, in even in the, the boom times of a couple of years ago, uh, when it feels like, you know, every company was very proud of doing things like four xing their headcount uh, in a year or six xing their headcount. Um, I actually remember our VP engineering raising her hand and saying, hey, we cannot onboard more folks than you know, 2x growth. That's going to be our bottleneck. We need to do this to retain our culture and our processes. And so that is where we will, we will pause. And coming into 23, this means that we have been able to not have to turn to layoffs. We've been able to continue to be very thoughtful about how we grow and build our, our teams. And, um, uh, you know, we, we actually published in our blog post around this, around this uh, raise that we earned a number of awards through compar comparably and great place to work um, on how strongly our team feels about being a part of the Honeycomb, uh, the Honeycomb team. I really, take, I really take my hat off for you. Congratulations, that's a great culture. Being cool and relevant is great and having a durable business that adds value and you maintain the growth wave, ride that growth wave is great success. And again, we've been following you guys for a while. And again, congratulations. And I'm so glad that you, you could come on the cube and share the news, Christine, and good luck. We'll see you at KubeCon and uh, certainly if not Amsterdam, we'll see you in Chicago. Awesome, thanks so much, looking forward to it. Christine Yen, co-founder and CEO of Honeycomb.io, CUBE alumni, real player in the industry, making the right moves in a market that is going with the huge waves in cloud native. The AI trend is going to surge right into it. It's the confluence of, of, the, of the whole cloud next gens here. It's a CUBE, we got you covered. I'm John Furrier, your host, thanks for watching.